someone who knew someone that asked you to do it. Today, you apply and you go for a rigorous background check, and even with all the background checks, you see what type of people get involved in government even, you know, within the past three or four months. So you just never know. The critical thing is the polygraphs. I never knew what I was going to do, where I was going to go, and before they accepted you, you have to pass more than one polygraph, the lie detectors, and the questions they ask you then were crazy. I mean, totally absurd. But, you know, as a young person, you do the best you can. Uh, it's honor, duty, and country, and when you're in the Secret Service, it's worthy of trust and confidence. And what you saw never happened there. And you never talked about it. 
and all the presidents that followed JFK. There was a lot of dirty old men, you know, but you look, and even though what they said, you didn't believe it unless you saw it yourself. However, at the time of the Kennedys, it was the United States version of royalty. Beautiful family. The economy was good. People were working. People had jobs. There was money around. And she was the epitome of a queen or a princess. Fine. Fine, fine lady. I remember seeing her one night coming out uh, wearing a, like, what do they call it? Pen I think, I think that's, that, that's the right word, white. And she was bringing Jack Kennedy a beer. You know, I put in Camp David or what have you. Different things, different things, you know, kind of happened that you remember distinctly. My wife and I sat in a couple of years ago at the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We sat in a row with uh, Dr. Sergei Khrushchev, who was the son of Nikita Khrushchev, who emigrated, and his wife, who emigrated to this country. And he's a professor at Brown University in Rhode Island. And sitting right in front of me was Caroline Kennedy's son, Jack Schlosser. And he's playing with his hair. I said, the epitome. My wife and I were talking, the epitome of a Kennedy, making sure his hair was in place. And it won't be in our time, but I, I think he's going to eventually become, you know, public official. He's going to run for office. There's a ton of them. There's Joe Kennedy, who's my congressman. And down here you have Billy Keating, who's the congressman, used to be a neighbor of ours in Sharon. His father was instrumental in asking me to run for the selectman many, many, many years ago in the town of Sharon, where I served for 32 years. And no one knew what I really did in my background, because I couldn't talk about it, I think, until 2010, when the FBI let me know that I could. And after our conversation, you know, when I called and asked, he says, Norman, this conversation never happened. Click. Back then, you could take someone's word for it. They weren't being taped or so on and so forth. Uh, Fifteen witnesses leaking news to what have you. My lectures usually consist of four areas. The assassination of President John Kennedy, November 22, 1963. Highlights of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. The continuity of the United States government in times of national disasters. United States Secret Service from the 1960s until the present time. It's pretty emphatic. And think of all the questions that you're going to have. And please do not hesitate to ask anything. Let me finish an area first, and then, then we can discuss it. You know, as long as the time, I'm not in a rush to leave. But, you know, sometimes you get exhausted, you know, you folks from here, hearing it over and over and over. But it's, it was a happening in our history. And you'll hear sounds and noises like happening. My opening remarks are dedicated to the men and women who walk the thin blue line in the law enforcement type of services. I don't have a script, folks, so I just tell it is it comes into my mind, and thank God it works most of, most of the time. They serve and protect under very often difficult circumstances. We've all had the honor and privilege that few in our nation can experience, those of us in federal law enforcement. I sincerely remember those who served with me in the military district of Washington. We have all taken the oath in different ways, depending on the service and agency. It all come down to duty, honor, and country. It seems to be more important to us then than it is now. We all watch the news, alternative news, fake news, real news, who knows. I 
cannot believe that more than 50 years have gone by since I was in the middle of two of the most tragic and significant events of the 20th century in the United States. I served as Special Agent, U.S. Secret Service, Military Attaché, Special Ops Division. When you're in the Special Ops Division, anyone who's looking for you can't find them. They don't exist. Records aren't allowed to be released, nothing. You just don't exist. You do your thing. Those who have to know where you are and what you do, know what you do. No one can talk about it. That stands true today. Some of the Navy SEALs never discuss it. Army Rangers, so on and so forth. You exist. No one talks about it. Now, but did I think that my position as an officer of the U.S. Army would grant me the esteemed office in the military district of Washington, D.C., at the White House? I was a skinny kid. I went to Northeastern, had trouble paying three to five hundred dollars a year tuition, borrowed money from my grandmother who had a seven-day variety store, and somehow we managed to get through. Where there's a will, there's a way. John F. Kennedy's election in 1960 coincided with the transition to a new era in American history. There was a marked difference between the outgoing Republican president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, his 70 year old grandfather, and former Army General, and the incoming charismatic 43 year old Democrat with the attractive wife, young daughter, and a new baby expected before the inauguration. Can you imagine the tragedies that that family would face over the years? It, it's, it's, it's just amazing. The challenges facing this new, relatively inexperienced president were daunting. However, he would have to prove himself. In the wake of the U-2 spy plane incident, tensions with the Soviet Union were high. Western Hemisphere, as Cuban's revolutionary leader Fidel Castro aligned his regime with the Soviets, many Americans believed war with the Soviet Union was inevitable. Additionally, racial tensions were mounting, especially throughout the South, as the civil rights movement was coming to the forefront. I do a lot of speaking about that now in a lecture series that takes you know, like three or four different times making appearances. Kennedy would note in his inaugural address, and you have to look at each distinct word. Let the word go forth. From this time and place, to friend and foe alike, that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. There was a confidence in John F. Kennedy, and his vision provided a sense of hope and promise. Quite different than the division among people, among friends, you know, that we have today. We get angry at our own members of our own family, at each other, about what's what's happening in, in, in the political world, the womanizing, the homophobia, the racial, the racial tensions, what's good for me and the hell with everyone else. I mean, it's how do you get the point to cabinet positions where a national and international embarrassment and plenty of well-educated people in this country and people of working people and people on fixed incomes totally understand that. He could really give a hell less about you and I. He takes care of his own takes care of his own. And I say that not in disrespect, but in truth. In truth. We've managed to alienate most of the countries in the educated world. They're all pissed off. You know, what did you do? Where do you go and you see people from foreign countries? They say, what happened to the United States? What happened? And we live it every day. And many say to me, well, give him a chance. Well, you know, I 
wrote something the other day about the investigator. Who's going to investigate the investigator who's conducting the investigation of someone who's being investigated? It's like the Abbott Costello scenario of who's on first. I have no idea what's going on. I don't think he wants to be there, and I'm sure his wife wants the hell out of here. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's terrible. She lived there, and he lived here, and, and somewhere they're in the kids are here, the kids are there. I mean, it costs us millions and millions and millions of dollars. That's not his fault, that's the United States. We have a policy, we will protect the family and the children. In fact, we may need 7,000 people to protect the family and the children. <laughs> Makes no difference how old you are or what you have experienced. There are times in your life that affect you so deeply that no matter what you do or how hard you try to erase them, your mind will never let the memory fade. President Kennedy's election in 1960 coincided with the blossoming of a new era in American history. In his eloquent and stirring inaugural address, President Kennedy stated, as I said before, let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike, that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. His words rang true for those of us in the younger generation. I was only 22, preparing to graduate college get married to my wife of over 50 years, go to Fort Gordon in Georgia, become commissioned as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army, and head off to an experience of unbelievable proportion and responsibility for an Army officer my age. I had no idea what my military life had in store for me. That my wife and I were on our way to the military district of Washington, D.C., and an assignment of the White House and the continuity of government program to serve as military attaché to the U.S. Secret Service. On November 22, 1963, three shots were fired in Dallas, Texas. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and the world stopped for four days. And it took seven seconds, and this was the sign that some of them heard, and you start to count down. And it was over. It was over. The first shot missed, because the presidential limo is an exact duplicate right there in the front table, was passing under a sign, a directional sign, that said some freeway, some freeway this way, that way, and hit the sign. You know, the first bullet went through the sign, and there was a man walking through that tunnel just before the sign with another man. And the bullet hit the sidewalk, and a piece of it flecked the grin hit his cheek, he was uh, just bleeding a little bit. And the young fellow said, well, hey, mister, you must have cut yourself shaving. He said, no, I just felt something, you know, hit, hit my face. I may have thrown a rock or something. The second shot went through President Kennedy's upper back in the limousine and out his throat. Went into the jump seat in front of him where Governor John Conley and his wife Nellie was sitting. Went through, went into his back, down his arm, and traveled around. And many people who write, who write books call it the magic bullet. It's impossible to do that. Let me tell you, and let me make it absolutely clear. The shooter was one man. Lee Harvey Oswald was the shooter. He was a marine marksman and job shooter. He had prepared the sniper's nest on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. He had a Mamlaker Gafano military, Italian military rifle with armor-piercing bullets that could go through five refrigerators. When a bullet hits you, 
It just doesn't go straight and come out. Sometimes if it hits a bone, it makes a turn, or it turns this way or that way. Just like our recent uh, senator was shot during the baseball practice last week. This was by a rifle shot who hit him in the hip. Went through all his lower internal organs, and the bullet is still in there. That was an armor piercing bullet. That was from an AK-47, these automatic rifles. That many of us feel like we need to have. We're going turkey hunting. Uh, absurd. One bullet go through five refrigerators. The third bullet hit the president from the back, the back of his head, and took out this whole portion of his head. And you see real pictures, not Photoshop, real pictures. There were eight sets of photographs made during that period by various offices within the White House. One always came to my office, the continuity of government program. I used to bring them home. I never realized, you know, I went into my briefcase when I would go home in the evening, or if I was duty off to say, go home the next day, and I saved everything. Like all of us, you find stuff many years later. Oh my God, what the hell do I have to do? They were all originals. His death certificate, everything. That's not you, you can find a lot of this on Google now, where you can look at it, more or less find anything. Some that are reproductions. What I have here is the original, the original set. And I'm looking for someone to possibly help me write a book. I can dictate and they can write. I'm, uh, you're not a writer. I can speak, but I, I can't put it, put it in proper prose for a book. For an entire generation, it was the end of an age of innocence, yet one of his most memorable quotes remain with us today. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you could do for your country. I will now discuss with all of you present here the facts that I have witnessed and have been a part of in the history of the United States. First of all, let me tell you about the White House. Everyone thinks, and some of you I told us earlier when I got here, first got here this evening, that the White House is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in D.C. Now, there is a physical structure there, and that's where a lot of ceremonies are held, and that's where the presidential family would stay or sleep, as guests, what have you. However, what really happens in this world, in this country, is outside. There are hardened sites in the mountains of Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. There are sites in West Virginia. There are sites in Colorado. There are sites in Pennsylvania. These are all underground. One Yet the most sophisticated site was the one that my wife and I worked in. And if you look up on Google when you get home, Mount Weather in Virginia. The White House has an, has an address of Bluemont, Front Royal, Washington, D.C., Arlington Hall Station, Winchester, Virginia. They're all decoys. They were all various names. When I used to come to work in the morning at this particular relocation point for the White House, you would drive up to a mountain, no street, it was a, a, a small highway, then you'd have to take a side road, and you all know where it is, no marking, and drive for several more miles, and then it seems like you're going downhill, and you park in a parking lot, seemed, seemed to be like under trees. You get out of your car and you start walking downstairs, still always on the outside, walking down maybe 100, 150 stairs. And when you get to the bottom of the stairs, it was like a platform, just a clearing. And you see slits in the rock, and you see 50 caliber machine guns sticking out 
of those slits when you had they had the Corps of Engineer Police. They had its own police force. And they would have a plastic at the beginning, and you had a badge, like those ID badges they wear today, various companies in the bank or some officials that you have to wear a badge to get in anywhere. Well, you had the first badge to get in on like this mule car, electric mule car, that dragged you into this mountain about a half a mile into a solid granite mountain. It had its own reservoir. It had its own fully staffed hospital, 24-7, as the doctors in Walter Reed Army Hospital rotated out of that area. We could house 3,000 people in there. We had a huge cafeteria. We could talk all around the world, the latest of sophistication and equipment, bedrooms, commissaries, mortuaries, everything, its own reservoir, its own sewage disposal site. It was amazing for 50 years ago. The first time you go there, you don't believe what you see. You don't believe it. As you go into that tunnel, you get to another blast gate that may have been 10 feet thick, tons, tons of cement, lead, what have you, that would hydraulically roll open and roll closed. Once everyone was in for the day, it would roll closed, and sometimes it takes 20 minutes back then. And you're sealed up. And once you're inside, you don't realize you're inside because there were numerous buildings. And there was one building in there called Building 7 that was an exact duplicate of the interior of the Kennedy's living quarters at the White House. And it was run by personnel that were assigned to the White House. But this White House, you had Norway, North American Air Defense. You had a ship on the East Coast USS Northampton, a ship on the West Coast, the USS Bright. You have a silver dollar flight in the sky. It's always available for the president to go in case of emergency. The continuity of government means, as far as I was concerned, if the president is incapacitated by a natural disaster, if the president is incapacitated by a nuclear holocaust, or if the president is incapacitated by an untimely death. And it's obvious, in this case, that we were called into action due to an untimely death. Never, ever, ever did we expect an assassination. There were 23 or 24 of us assigned to go to Dallas. And Dallas was considered politically hostile because our ambassador to the United Nations back then, Adlai Stevenson, when he was there, was spit on, cursed at, and everyone by some of the people in Dallas. Not everyone, but by some of them. You know, oh, Yankees are coming down, you know, the, uh, many still fight the Civil War. What war is civil? You know, they, they still, you know, with the Confederate flag, it's important. It's important. Texas, they felt, was a country into itself, and they could do whatever they want. It's very, very, very difficult. And those in authority tried to tell the president that it was dangerous. But he felt that he owed it to Lyndon Johnson, who was from Texas. It was an election year, uh, Senator uh, Congressman Yarbrough, Sam Yarbrough, and, and, and a few others. And he said he just had to go. And Jackie Kennedy hated the limelight. She hated you know, for her kids to be seen anywhere or anything to be shown about them. She was a very, very, very ladylike, private individual. She agreed to go election year, you know, it's her husband. And her, one of her remarks were, was that, look, every place I went in Texas, 
They gave me yellow roses. That's the national flower. You know, yellow rose of Texas. Only in Dallas was I given red roses. Was that a symbol? Was, was that a sign of something? And within the next 15, 20 minutes, he was gone. It was, it was difficult. It was difficult. And the whole scenario at the hospital and what the Secret Service did, no doubt, there were some of the guys drinking the night before. Could that have affected their reactions? Could have. But when you're driving in an open limousine down a predetermined and pre-advertised route of passage with a marine sharpshooter few floors up with a skull and an armor-piercing rifle and the limousine is supposed to go no less than 15 miles an hour. No less. That's why you usually see the fellows trotting beside the limousine. And the president said he didn't want anyone riding on the back. If they were standing on the back, there's two running boards on the back with a handle to hold on to. If they were standing up at the depository, the shooter could never get a shot off and hit the president. He didn't want anyone on. Everyone thought it was the motorcycles backfiring around the motorcade. They were in a wrong type of formation. Anyway, it wouldn't have made any difference. Because as they rounded the front in Dealey Plaza, in front of the Texas School Book Depository, Lee Harvey Oswald fired the first shot. No one heard it. Motorcycles were slowing, they were backfiring. The second shot, Clint Hill was <clears throat> riding on the running board right beside the driver of the backup Secret Service limousine, thought he heard something, got off and started running towards the presidential limousine. And just as he hit the back of that limousine, Jack Kennedy was getting up, the third shot was fired, a piece of the president's skull flew out, and it was laying on the back of that Lincoln limousine, and she was attempting to get it. Clint Hill was sprayed with brain matter and pieces of skull, and he jumped forward, pushed her in, and told him to get out of there. Protocol for the driver, <clears throat> Billy Greer, a trained driver of the presidential limousine. If you hear something, don't turn around and look. Step on the gas and get the hell out of line. You have a destination to go. You're a bang. Billy Greer slowed down and turned around and looked. It was a human, a human thing to do. Roy Kellerman, the agent in charge of the Texas operation, was right in the jump seat, front seat beside him. He was riding a shotgun. He also turned around and looked. Mistake number two. It was too late. Open car like shooting fish in a barrel. And they headed off to Parkland Hospital. And when they got there, basically, how do you know when someone says, you can't pronounce, you, you know, when does life really end? When you start breathing, sometimes it's full of heartbeats. There was still something. It was the President of the United States. Blood transfusions, so on and so forth. And I'm going to read something to you in a, in a few minutes. It's just amazing. They did what they could. Lyndon Johnson was pulled out of his limousine before it headed, you know, to Parkland Hospital. Wait, I'm sorry. Once it got there, 
He was pulled out so fast that he wet his pants as they were pulling him and Lady Bird up the stairs in a little private room in the hospital. And he was in there. And he kept on asking, how was the president? No one would tell him anything. The White House was run by the Irish Mafia. Kenny O'Donnell, Larry O'Brien, and Davy Powers. They were all dead. And Bobby Kennedy. They hated Lyndon Jones. The only one who liked him was JFK. And his words were very often, please, you have to let Lyndon in on what in hell is going on. You have to let him know what's going on. Okay, we will. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. They were all, you know, college buddies. And they ran the show. They didn't like him. He kept on asking. He kept on asking. The first call that came back to the White House. We had walkie-talkies. The walkie-talkies were useless. You could use them as a projectile at the throat itself. When the president was shot and Clint Hiller got on, he could he could see. It was a quick movement where he pulled his ear. That means it's a fatal hit. The guy in the follow-up car sucked. The front car was driven by Chief Jesse Curry of the Dallas Police Department. It was a white car. And then it was Winston Win Lawson. Win Lawson is still alive. I think he's in his 90s. He's in a home of California. He's the one who had a radio in from the cruiser, Dallas police cruiser, into the Dallas police headquarters, who called, was an agent in there, who called back to the White House. We call it Crown. That was the word at the time. The cold word for white was Crown. I answered the phone. I said, is, you know, what's, what's what we were talking pretty much in the, in, in the open. And we said, what we have to do here is Bobby Kennedy's coming, this, everything is starting to happen, and you have a massive perspiration, and you're just trying to keep all your thoughts together because you have a mission and a job to do. This is what we have to do. We've got to get Lyndon Johnson out of there. By our Constitution, as soon as the president is incapacitated, he's the president. When Rufus Youngblood, his agent, jumped on him when the shots were first fired in the third car back, he hollers to Rufus Youngblood, get the hell off, of me. get off of me. And Rufus Youngblood says, Mr. President, he says, just lay still. We have to find out what's going on. He says, I'm not the president, I'm the vice president. He let it slip because those of us in the Secret Service, we know when someone has a fatal wound, but we're not allowed to publicize it to anyone except ourselves. We don't announce the death of, of the president. That's, that's not in our purview. We're not physicians. We can be first responders, but we can't, we can't say anything. They get into Parkland Hospital, and he's being treated. And then he, we have to get him out. And we try to get Lyndon Johnson out of there. And his words were, I am not leaving without Mrs. Kennedy and the president. Before he even knew that he was fatally shot. I am not leaving without the president, Mrs. Kennedy. Well, where is the safest place for him to be right now? The safest place would be for him to get his back to Love Field, where US-1 is. That, you know, it's all open. All, the police are all surrounded now with a few of the agents and some of the military that were called in. So we got him back on the plane and it was a waiting thing. Let me read some things that Jack Kennedy remembered. Jacqueline Kennedy would always remember the roses. Three times that day, before she got to Dallas, while she was with the president, on this visit to Texas, she was delighted 
as people presented her with yellow roses, of which Texas is so famous for. Only in Dallas was I given red roses, roses, she said. How funny, she thought. Red roses for me. Soon the back seat of the presidential limousine would be strewn with blood-soaked rose petals. A surreal image she would never be able to erase from her mind. But for now as a presidential party riding the limo, basked in the beautiful noonday sunlight, that day in Dallas, and cheers from the crowds that lined the streets, and Jackie seemed happier and closer than I have ever been. And these are from her words. The 46-year-old president and his 34-year-old first lady exchanged one final glance, and then in an instant, it all ended. The look on Jack's still boyish face, the moment the first bullet struck him on the back of the neck, severing his windpipe, and exiting his throat would haunt Jackie's dreams for the rest of her life. He looked puzzled, she later said. I remember he looked as if he just had a slight headache. For a split second, Jackie thought the crack she had heard was the sound of a police motorcycle in the motorcade backfiring until she realized she was watching as if in slow motion the president's head began to pull apart. I could see a piece of the skull coming off, she recalled. It was flesh color, not white. I could see this perfectly clean piece of skull detaching from his head. Then he slumped in my lap. Texas Governor John Conley, riding in the jump seat in front of the president, had also been seriously wounded. Oh, no, no, he yelled. They're going to kill us all. John Conley's wife, Nellie, who was with her husband, was now covered with blood and bits of brain matter from JFK's head wound. She looked back at the First Lady. As Jackie Kennedy said, I have his brains. Jackie said that she sat staring for a full seven seconds in my hands. The driver of the presidential limo, Special Agent Billy Greer, floored the accelerator, and the sensation of enormous speed gave Jackie a sudden jolt of adrenaline. It nearly dislodged. Secret Service agent Clint Hill was holding on to that back jump seat right behind her from his tenuous perch on the limo. Ever since the first shot rang out, Hill, who had been riding in the back of her, had sprinted to catch up. He finally reached, as I said, the president limo, just as a third shot struck, spraying him with bits of bone and brain matter. What Agent Hill witnessed, along with the breathless nation, was something that Jackie herself would not remember. Numb with shock and panic, Jackie clambered onto the slippery trunk of the limo. Too many it appeared as she, if she was trying to get out. She was reaching for a large chunk of the skull that slid off onto the grass, and we got that anyway. He pushed her back as they sped off to Parkland Hospital. With a 190 pound hill sprawled over her, trying to act as a human shield for both the president and the first lady. Jackie cradled her husband's shattered head in her lap. She pressed down on the top with her white gloved hands, as she said later, to keep the brains in. Jackie's head was down, her face only inches from the president's. She was struck by the pink rose ridges inside his broken skull, she later said, and the fact that despite everything from the hairline down, his head was so beautiful. I tried to hold the top of his head down. Maybe I could keep it in, but I knew he was dead. So did the crowds that lined the Dallas streets. They're all screaming, he's dead, he's dead. She could hear people shouting as the motorcade took off and sped toward Parkland Hospital. Jackie climbed with the slimmest hope that maybe there was life still there, a latent, quickly ebbing consciousness. Jack, 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 can you hear me? She whispered over and over into his ear. The president's blue eyes were wide open in a fixed stare. I love you, Jack, Jackie said. I love you. Although she later said it seemed like an eternity, it took seven minutes before the limo came to a halt at the emergency room entrance of Parkland Hospital. Agent Clint Hill and Special Agent Judge Roy Kellerman and Jack 
Okay, his longtime aide, Amy Powers, about to lift the president off the waiting stretcher. But Jackie refused to let him go. He's Mrs. Kennedy, Clint Hill said. We must get him inside to the door. I'm not, not letting him go, Mr. Hill, she said. You know he's dead. Leave me alone. Clint Hill understood. Jackie did not want the world to see the gaping grave in her husband's scalp. Struggling to control his own emotions, Hill took off his sport jacket and cut it, wrapped it around the president's head. At that time, Jackie allowed him to take him into the doctor. It wasn't repulsive to me for one moment, she said. Nothing was repulsive to me. And I was running behind with the coat covering his head. Incredi incredibly, the president had a faint pulse and was still breathing when he was admitted to Parkland Motor Hospital, simply his case 24740, white male, gunshot wound. Inside trauma room one, team of doctors, soon joined by White House physician Admiral George Berkeley, immediately began to administer massive blood transfusion. Jackie went into that room. Two Texas interns tried to get her to leave. They kept grabbing me, she said. She says, I'm not leaving. And finally, they were convinced to let her stay there. No one seemed to notice that during all this time, Jackie had her left hand cupped over something. And as she was standing beside Dr. Marion Jenkins, the chief anesthesiologist there at Parkland, she says, I have something for you. And he turned around and put his hand out, and she put some of the president's brains in his hands. Tears were streaming down his face as he was leaning against the bank. Now, priest had forbidden. The president had to be pronounced dead. Lyndon Johnson is a couple of floors up in the room, wants to know what's going on. Finally, it was determined that he had to leave the hospital, Lyndon Jones. The fellows are prepared to take JFK's body out of the hospital because Jackie Kennedy says, don't let those goddamn Texans near it. Get them the hell out of there. Secret Service was prepared to take the body out. The Attorney General of Texas, his representative, shows up at the door and says, you're not going anywhere. This was a crime committed in the state of Texas. You have no authority. Bobby Kennedy, who's on the line, says, bullshit. If you have to shoot your way out of there, shoot anyone in front of you, and I'll call people in from the nearest military base, and we'll shoot them all. Get him the hell out of there. That was a mistake. To be honest, this is in hindsight. Because at Parkland Memorial Hospital, there were two forensic pathologists on duty. When he came back to Andrews Air Force Base to go to Bethesda Naval Hospital, there were two interns on duty. And there were books written about this books written about that, that he's switching coffins, and it wasn't him, it was someone else. When the fellas were trying, after the Texas Attorney General agreed that if someone from Texas, you know, an attorney from you know, an assistant district attorney went with them, it would be okay to leave. Because there would have been a shootout there. No doubt. Because emotion was overtaken reason. They get him in a coffin, and as they're pushing, you see pictures of them pushing the coffin up the stairs of Air Force One. The goddamn thing don't fit through the door because of the hands. Someone hollers, get a tie ride. You know, the light wrench to pop the handles off the coffin so they can push it in because they almost slipped down the stairs with no one time. And you can picture all the emotions at, at this time and the confusion. 
guard men. Johnson's sat in the front, the Kennedy's sat in the back. An unbelievable thing. Now, again, the call comes in to the White House. Where should we go? Where should we land? I was speaking with two, being the communication officer, to two of the major generals who were there and uh, Chief Warren Officer Bill Elder, who ran the White House Communications Agency, as he was the ranking official on duty most of the time, and he reported to uh, General uh, Alvin Albright. The President's Cabinet, eight members of the President's Cabinet, Cabinet along with the Secretary of State, were on their way to Japan. And they had already left Hickam Field in Hawaii, heading towards Japan. We had to get that plane turned around. Try to notify the plane. When I reach the plane, the captain of that plane says he has to get the code book to confirm that it's who's calling about what. Good find each plane, US-1, or Air Force 1, US-2, Air Force 2, US-3, Air Force 3, whatever. Each one has a cold book that changes weekly. Couldn't find it. In the confusion and, and, and reference, it was there. It was just buried. Something was put on top of something else. So we had to talk in the open. Who would recognize my voice? Only one person. It was P.S. Allinger, the press secretary. I said, can I speak with, you know, Secretary Salinger? And he could on, he says, Norman, what's going on? And I told him, the president is dead. And this was in the open because we had no other choice. He says, well, should the plane come back to Dallas or should the plane come to Washington, D.C.? He said, but I can't make that decision. He says, he can't, you know, he has to have the Secretary of State talk to someone and he's not going to talk to you. He says, can you get a hold of Major General Jack Albright? And I said, I said, yes, we can. Got a hold of Chief Warren Officer Bill Elder, who was there in the room with me by his communications agency, who immediately got Albright, who was in the building somewhere there, and he came right over, and he spoke in the open to Secretary of State Press. He said, the body, the president has to come back, and you have to turn around and come back to Andrews Air Force Base, because we're gonna take the president to Bethesda Naval Hospital. And this was all happening from White House, number two, on Pennsylvania Avenue, from the mountain, where we were. Any major activity comes out of that mountain. Plane turned around and obviously headed back to, you know, to uh, Andrews, but the plane carrying the president you know, August is not the first from Dallas to, uh, to D.C. It was held a lot closer than flying across the whole country and hot, hot way out, almost to Japan. And he was brought, as I said, to Bethesda Naval Hospital. Kennedy was a naval, not a former naval officer, and Admiral George Berkeley, his personal physician, went there. And we didn't have the right people. They did the autopsy. It was no, no big deal. It was anyone else. It was an autopsy. However, some evidence got misplaced or out. And that, a lot of that led to various conspiratory theories. Everyone thought something else. And why did they do this? Or why did they do that? It was all a matter of happenstance. No one planned it, and 
no one did it on purpose. It was one hell of a day and one hell of a ride for all of those up there involved. Here you have a young president, thousand days, thousand days, and the world stopped still for four days. Every time it just stopped. And Mrs. Kennedy was part of the one who was planning the funeral. She had the ability still to work on it, and it was protocol as to where it would be, who would attend. And you have to think which country comes first in the procession line. Is it France, England, Ireland, Belgium, Ethiopia? And you see the pictures that I have of, of the lines of the first group of people. You see Charles de Gaulle, who's like eight foot seven, <laughs> like a basketball player. He stood up above everyone. And Haile Selassie of Ethiopia in full dress uniform, and Cardinal Cushing, Archbishop Cushing of Boston, at the time he was doing the eulogy and the procession with the heart. I mean, this thing went off. It was amazing. And all those behind the scenes were half alive, really, from fright, from emotion, depression, and everything that went with it. It was an incredible time. Was in a dry eye anywhere. And what that family has gone through over, over the years, I mean, what they have gone through, the tragedies, you know, that they had faced. And then you have the conspiracy, the conspiracy theory. It drives you crazy. We have a lot more to talk about. Let me just touch on a couple of them. More than 54 years later, the subject of Kennedy's death still fascinates the world. He was shot on November 22nd. Lee Harvey Oswald did it. Investigations started in 1964. The Warren Commission concluded that Kennedy was killed by a lone assassin, Oswald, while three other investigations in 1968, 1975, and 1978 and 79 confirmed the commission's conclusion that JFK had been killed by two shots fired from behind. Now, people have said, well, they saw Billy Greer, the driver, turn around and shoot John Kennedy right there. People say that they saw Jacqueline Kennedy when she was walking into Parkman Hospital take a small revolver and leave it in a plant as she went into the hospital. People saw these men behind the high fence, the high wooden fence, shooting. And then they saw Secret Service agents running down the field, you know, on the, on the grassy knoll there. Well, how did you know they were Secret Service agents? Well, because of their badges. Well, in the early 60s, the 1960s, the Secret Service agents didn't wear any badges. You had to commission in a folded leather case in, in your suit jacket. They were finding all kinds of uh, uh, cockamamie stories. And, and the trouble is, some of these people believed that they, they believed this. And they were dedicated. They did some movies. And, and everyone has an idea, and I've been criticized, but how the hell do you know? Well, who knows anything, you know? I was part of this whole thing. I know more than this person does. Am I sure that there was no conspiracy? No. Lee Harvey Oswald, he gets arrested. He's the one who did it, and it's funny how he gets arrested. Someone saw a man leaving the Texas School Book Depository, a skinny guy with a white t-shirt and khaki color pants, ran out. On his way into work that morning, he carpooled with another guy. 
And he had like a green trash bag, something like that. And the fellow who was driving said, Lee, what do you got? What's in the bag? He said, oh, those are curtain rods. I have to get curtains, you know, for the house, you know, back home during lunch on the water or something. So they just let go. During the time of the shooting, they said, Lee, aren't you going to come down? We're all going downstairs to watch the president for the motorcade. He's not too busy. He said, I won't go now. I'll see it afterwards. When they all went down, he went up. He did the shooting. There was more than one person who saw him in the window. And I was in the window. You know, they're all hanging out. It was too late. It was too late. But they saw someone running from the building, similar to what they saw up there, and dressed in how he was dressed. So the Dallas police get notified that we're looking for a guy. About Five four five five, slight build, white T-shirt, and we need him for question. Here's Oswald walking down one of the streets in Dallas, in a residential neighborhood, and there's a cruiser there with Officer J. T. Tippett, Dallas Police. He rolls out and says, "Hey, Mister, come over here." Didn't get out. Didn't draw his weapon, get it ready. He thought maybe he fit that description. Oswald was carrying a revolver. He walked right over to the car. He said, you want me? He said, yeah, now you. Now he gets out of the car. He's, he's sitting. Oswald leans in, bang, 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 and kills him. And then he takes off again. Now they're still looking for him. About 15, 20 minutes go by. And there's a movie theater in Dallas, a small movie theater. And a woman calls the police department. And her exact words were, you know, you gotta get over here. She says, some son of a bitch just snuck into the theater and didn't pay a quarter for his ticket. <laughs> the dispatcher says, well, what, what was he wearing? Well, he had a white t-shirt on, a skinny guy. And he didn't pay for that goddamn ticket. Did you get in the theater? They all, of course, the police, it was like an armed invasion. <coughs> And Oswald just hands up. I give up. And he was taken into custody. So they parade him to the Dallas police headquarters. And here's this guy, Jack Ruby, who killed Oswald. Three or four doors up from the Dallas police headquarters, he had a bar and a strip joint where all the cops used to drink there by night. Some people hang around bar rooms. Some people hang around fire stations, and some people hang around police stations. This guy was a permanent fixture in the Dallas Police Department. Always dressed. You wouldn't, if there was a big thing going on and he was there, he's out of the crowd. He wouldn't be questioned, what are you doing here? He knew everything that was going to happen. He was one of the boys. And he loved the Kennedys. He loved the Kennedys. And he was questioned for three years before he passed away by every single investigative agency in the United States. FBI, Secret Service, CIA, Army Intelligence Agency, Treasury Department, National Security Agency. His story never changed even with truth theory. He felt bad. He says, I thought I was doing the country a favor by killing that son of a bitch. The rest is history. Not that the Russians, but the Russians didn't want him. The Cubans didn't want him. He applied the visa to go to both countries. Oswald was married to a, uh, a Russian woman, very, very, very nice. She didn't want him either. He was Section 8, unfit for military service, out of the Marines. That's how he got out. And they usually deranged. They usually screwed up somehow. Every other attempted assassination on any president in this country, it wasn't a conspiracy. It's usually a lone nut. 
Squeaky Brown, Sarah Jane Moore, John Hinckley was trying to impress, you know, was it Jody Foster or something? It's usually a night. So, as an agent, you have to learn and understand profiling. Someone acting unusual. Is it a hot day and they're wearing a heavy coat? Are they sweating profusely? Are they looking back and forth? Does, it, does something seem out of all that? Yeah. You miss it. You miss it. And is it going to happen again? It's not a matter of if it's going to happen again. It's when. Because if you're a public official, no matter how good the Secret Service agent is, and you get out of what they call a PPD, the protective, you know, division line. You get out of that line and you got to go shake hands with someone. Some, some bitch is going to get in there with a gun or somebody and let you have it. It's physically impossible. Look at these, just recently, you see what happened at the White House when well, President Obama was in office there. The fence jumpers running across the lawn with their dogs, with cameras, with Snipers on the roof of the White House, he didn't run up the front stairs, make a left, head down towards the East Room. How the hell does that happen? We're human beings. Nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. And it'll happen. <coughs> it'll, it'll, it'll happen again. I hope not in my life. It's, it's, a, it's an awful thing. Never, ever, ever did anyone, does anyone in charge or responsible, want to lose your protectee. It's just not in the plans. No more open cars. Now the cars are all sealed and they refer to as the beast. The current presidential limousines are, have their own air conditioning, their own air filtration system, their own water system. When the presidential limousine moves, this is around 14 or 15 follow-up cars, like plain black uh, SUV, you know, Chevrolet Suburbans. Some of them, the roof slides back. Rockets, cannons, some of them are filled with medical personnel. Snipers, counter-terrorism experts. The doctors are always right with you. You can't shoot that presidential limousine down. You're hitting the tires, even a tank would give it a hit and it would tip and upright itself. It's pretty hard to knock that out. The windows, uh, it's usually all classified. They're about as thick as the old yellow pages used to be, you know, with the phone book. You can't, you can't get the gas. So the protection is better. But once you step out of that zone, somehow, somewhere, someone, is going to be successful in doing something, which I hope it never happens to anyone. It's a human life. We can agree or disagree. You just hope it never happens to anyone. But in this day and age and in this world, you know, safe in schools, churches, movies, shopping malls, restaurants, anyways, going to work, subway, have you. They're out there. My God's better than your God, so they're one of kid you It's crazy. That's the society we live in. Who has the most gun killings in the, in the world? The United States. But when you think, well, you know, if you don't have one, what if I had one? What if I didn't? You, you don't know what's right. But no one needs living in the home. You don't go hunting with an AK-47. I couldn't shoot a, a bird or anything like that. But I could take out a person. That, that's me. I couldn't, I couldn't go hunting. A lot of people love it. It's, maybe it's a good sport. But we all have guns. There's more guns in this country than people. Almost twice as many. And a fellow or a woman owns a gun, she don't own the own one gun. They own rifles, shotguns, 
military type weapons. What are we going to do? What the hell good is an AK-47 going to do if this is a nuclear attack on this country? Now let me even show this yourself. So that's what we live with. So before I go on with the Cuban Missile Crisis, does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you walk up to the microphone, please? So we can, so we can all. You have to speak right into the right into the mic. Well, It, it happened within within about a half hour, 40 minutes. It, it, it happened pretty quick. Uh, he didn't have to be sworn in because the mantle of the presidency automatically falls on him. However, his people felt that it should be done at that particular time. There was a judge there that he knew, and he wanted Mrs. Kennedy to come up and stand with him. And obviously, we all saw that she did. It was very, very moving. Mm -hmm. And he was very, very nice to her he, for years afterwards. But it happened pretty quick. I mean, he, you know, he said, so not going, but he, he left the hospital. They covered him over and they didn't even give him a chance to ask him that he wanted to go. He was gone. You know, he was in there on that plane. He had to be protected. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay. And you'll be right after me, please. I want to start by thanking you for your service. Um, I remember being a kid and reading a book about the growth, the development of the Secret Service at the New Grad Treasury Department. Yeah. Um, an incredible amount of pride and elitism, military organization with a lot of discipline. Um, we now hear reports about agents off duty being drunk and driving into the guardhouse at the White House, yeah. agents on duty with prostitutes. Um, I know I, I, I'm in a union and I quite a work with a prostitute drunk. I'd probably be fired. Um, and so I'm wondering what happened to that organization, leadership, accountability, um, all of those things. When you have 7,000, at least 7,000 employees. The oath that they take, worthy of trust and confidence. You have what's called the frailties of the flesh. Anything can happen. They take the oath, who knows how many are worthy. The elite agency, the PPD, the Presidential Protective Division, are supposedly above that. I can't speak for anyone but myself. When I was there, there were 312. We all knew who was covering each other. The night before Kennedy was assassinated, 10 of them, it's about half, were out drinking until early in the morning. But it wouldn't have made any difference, but that's not the point. That's not the point. They were wrong. That was part of the bad protocol then. Maybe if they were alert, someone would have saw someone up there with a rifle sticking out of the window. You know, you go to sleep at 3 in the morning and you have to be up at 6 in the morning to have a detail with the President of the United States and get this motorcade ready to go to a breakfast and then go to, an, you know, to another parade, head into a lunch. And you're hot shit faced, you know. What's going to happen? You know, who knows? They were wrong. And these 7,000, a lot of bad apples. Like when a police officer goes on tour of duty, they say, Black Lives Matter, 
white lives matter, everyone's life matters. They don't plan to get up in the morning, well, yeah, I'm going out, let's see where I can shoot today. That's usually not a case. Husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, children, they all want to come home alive and well. In this business, when you get a badge and a gun, there's a chance you may not come home. That's what happened to the Secret Service today. They as selective? I don't think so. Is it part of the command? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. So I have a, a friend that worked at this company called Gold Garnet in Cambridge, and they um, did an acoustic. Um, they did an acoustic um, test on the shots. Yeah. And he um, he said they found that the shots came from more than one location. So I just want to know what I should. I'm, I am aware of several. The FBI did more than one. Army Security Agency did more than one. The NSA did more than one. The Secret Service did more than one. And medical professionals who really know by the head wound and all the information we have, the shot was fired from the rear. If you've been hit from the rear, you usually go back first and then forward. We've seen many, many pictures, you know, photographs, videos of that actually happened. And I witnessed it twice with the FBI here in Boston of, of that happening. It was a rear, a womb, upper rear. I mean, it can't shoot from up above and out and have something go in here and out the back. This shot went in his back and out his throat. Not vice versa. We have yet to be able to prove any other reason beyond any reasonable doubt that it was a rear gunshot and no one would be able to convince me that it was anything other than that. But there are companies that get their stuff together and the acoustics and the sound and, and the, the weapon, if you have the exact same type of weapon, the same type of ammunition. I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but I can only let you know what, and share with you what I know. It was one shooter about in Rio. And the Warren Commission was some of the finest individuals. Don't forget party affiliation in the country at the time, the most respected and honored individuals that we could possibly have. There's no, you know, no reason to doubt their findings. Chief Justice Earl Warren, you know, obviously the others with him, but there are some people in this day and age who say, I'm totally nuts. Chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, everyone looking for different flavor. But that's that's my answer to the best of my ability. It, it has been reproduced many times. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for coming here this evening and speaking to us. I've often wondered about the Supreme Bill and how much time there was from the assassination and Mr. Zapruder filming that when, and the government actually getting their hands on that and, and discovering what was on that film. Thank you. That's a great question. Abraham Zapruder Obviously, he's passed. He's passed away. Uh, he was a clothing maker, a tailor, in uh, 
the Texas area. And he was a, a photographer as a, as a whole. And I, there's pictures of him that I have here. Up on that platform, he never realized what he had. You know, just rolling his camera and, and taking it, and taking photos. And I think it was after he got home and heard what had happened, he realized that he had everything on, on his, uh, what was it, eight, eight millimeter, I think, or 60 millimeter camera. I, I don't have a cat in the day. You know, the, the home movies were, were an eight millimeter camera. And I, I remember them taking frame by frame by frame, all these experts looking at it, seeing how long it took, but it was just about a day or so. Yeah, he didn't have it that long. I don't know the exact time, but he, 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 he gave it up. And I think it belongs to the family. His family, I think, still so, have the rights to it. But that was part of the whole thing. And it was a huge, huge help. I mean, some of the frames, the pictures I have in here, you can see the first, you know, one frame movement, and the second frame, then you can see the implosion. An explosion of one frame where you see the blood on the frame, everything flying up in the air. And that was again another frame. Anyone else? Hi. I'm quite appreciative of you being here and the low key ability that we have to come up and ask you any question because yeah. I think it's rather unusual to have somebody with a personal account. So I'm grateful. I'm recalling what you said earlier about the white penoir and bringing the beer to uh, John F. Kennedy. And um, I see that as something of a juxtaposition to how he wound up leaving Dallas. Um, I haven't read an awful lot about the circumstances, but have watched some shows on PBS. And one of them indicated that it was quite important to uh, former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy to uh, make an appearance when LBJ was sworn in, uh, in the same blood-spattered dress that she wore that day. Since you have more of a bird's eye view, personally, um, I don't know if you have any opinions about why it was important to her, obviously you can't speak to her, you know, for her, uh, why it was it so important to her to continue wearing the blood splatter dress when she was sworn in? She said on more than one occasion, because they asked her if she wanted to change while she was in Parkland Hospital. One of the police officers from Dallas was there and asked her, Mrs. Kennedy, do you want a cigarette? And she said, yes. She was an avid smoker, never in public. And then Davy Powers, as someone else, said to Mrs. Kennedy, do you want to change your clothes? She said unequivocally, no. I want them to see what they did to my husband. Those were her words. And she refused to take off that pink suit. That's the truth. The whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help me go. And she was impeccably dressed all the time. But that was going through her mind to show the world what they did to her husband. Well, just real briefly, um, it seems that it's very important to you to use a code book of sorts. Where would you place that in the code book? of being a lady, but also being a patriot. Do you think that that was the right decision, you personally, for her to show the rest of the world what happened to her husband? Me? Yes. I think so. I mean, I love that family. I remember good times until that time. And it was her husband, and it was a 
a national and international tragedy. And she, just, she didn't want them to see her, his head in that way. But she wanted to let the world know this is what they did to my husband, not knowing who did it at the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Uh, also want to thank you very much for enlightening us and sharing your, your truths with us because I know that you are the youngest amongst all of them. I'm the baby. And you don't care. Well, thank goodness that you're still sparky and smucky and sharing. Uh, just um, um, the route of the motorcade. Had this been changed? Had they, they this wasn't published? It wasn't the published. They never do that anymore. The route was published. It was published. Yeah. Now, they may have changed something about going under a bridge or over a bridge at the last minute, but it was heading right through Dealey Plaza. I see. Right through Dealey so, Plaza, and it was published in the Dallas, I think, Tribune was it. That I, I, now, he was conveniently working there, Oswald? Yes. Isn't that? Now, he was working there for several months, yeah. to the best of my knowledge. Right. Okay, well, just want to clear that up in my part of mind, but thank you very, very much for being here. This, thank you. There's ways to find out how long he worked at the Texas School Book Depository. Well, uh, I remember he had piled books up, uh, yeah. boxes of books, and had some, like, made a little fort. Yeah, oh, well, yes, he had a, a sniper's nest right there. Yeah. Yeah, but, but this, there's pictures of it in, in, oh, I'm in, 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 in some of my presentations. Wow. You know, some okay. Of my and now you're looking for a writer, so if I know of someone that's very good at transcribing thoughts, please find them up. Please find it. Yeah. Or yeah. Or yeah. A we need to all please. Know. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, yes, ma'am. I just had a question about. Um, the aftercare of, the, of people who witnessed this incident. Was there such a thing? Um, now PTSD is such a catchphrase and people immediately uh, help the first responders. Was there anything like that going on back then? No. <laughs> no, not that I know. What do you think? That I need some PTSD or we just want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> she went on a component start of family. Yeah, no, there was. Nothing that I know. It wasn't considered battle fatigue. It was a different kind of battle fatigue. Yes, ma'am. Kind of a follow-up to the question before. So how long had he been planning this? Was it spontaneous or was it determined what exactly his motivation was? He was just as friendly. Do you have your eyes well? Yes. Unfortunately. We didn't have a chance to question him. But no indication from his wife or co-workers or anything else? He was the, a misfit. He wanted to leave the United States. Once he got tossed out, basically, you know, mentally incompetent to serve in the military, he wanted to go to Russia. They didn't want him. And he wanted to go to Cuba. And Casper, you know, no one wanted him. He was a deranged individual. You know, he didn't go in like everyone else and fill up the bomb and everything that's wonderful. I want to visit and I want to teach or what I want to do. It was different. So I can't speak for any foreign embassies or foreign countries. I just know from my background and what we have determined. You know, his background was in papers, that official government documents, he wasn't that. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I have to preface this by saying I was a fan of Lyndon Johnson. But when you described the inauguration, or the swearing in on the plane, and bringing Mrs. Kennedy into that section of 
I can't believe that Lyndon Johnson was not aware of how much this, as you call it, Irish mafia did not like him. And was that, do you think, being a human being, which he, Johnson was, do you think any of that was meant to show who was boss? Yes, I, I, I do. Lyndon Johnson was a tough old Texan, and he knew how to get things done. He knew how to get things done. He was very, very, very nice to Mrs. Kennedy and the president. They were his friends, not the administration, not the staff, not his, not Bobby Kennedy. They didn't like him. I had no idea. I was a kid. I had no idea why, but I knew they didn't like him. But if a deal had to be made, Lyndon was the go-to guy. He says, you scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. You know. But he, he drove Ladybird to drink, that's for sure. I know a lot about him. He was rude. But he wanted to, he wanted to do the right thing. You have to twist or break a few arms or legs. That they, they would get done. He wanted the civil rights, but he used the words. You know, he said, we got to get these niggas taken care of. Terrible. But, you know, that was his way. That was his way. And he cared about Jacqueline Kennedy. He absolutely did. And I think he wanted her to stand there with him. I mean, I, I wasn't on that plane. But I, you know, you just feel it. I could feel it for him, and I could feel it for her. He was petrified. He was petrified. Okay, let me go on. If there's no other questions, I want to. I can't keep you here all night, even though I can stay. And let's talk about the the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a great movie out about that. What's, what, was, what, was, what was the name of that movie, Marina? Was it Seven Days in May? Or, Seven uh, Days. Yes. That was, I want my wife to see that movie when it came out. It was so real. We went, we went by ourselves. When we were driving home, I was so shaken by the reality of that movie that I made a left hand turn and I missed the street and drove up over the aisle. <laughs> Needless to say, that was the closest that this country came to a nuclear holocaust today. Today. We had found out through the YouTube flights that Russia was building intercontinental ballistic missiles and bringing them to Cuba. Back in the early 60s, just prior to the Bay of Pigs, they had 20 to 40,000 Russian troops on the islands, the country of Cuba, about 90 miles off the coast of the United States. It's absurd when you start to think about it. And it's going back and forth, back and forth, we had plenty of pictures, and you, we, those of us who were alive at the time remember Adlai Stevenson speaking at the United Nations and showing the Russians pictures of those silos and whatever they were building there in Cuba. And the Russians would deny, 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 deny. And what was, it, what was his words, Adlai Stevenson's words? Well, I can wait till hell freezes over until you give me an answer. I think it's Ambassador Dobrina. I think that was his name. Uh, and we just couldn't live in this country with that threat so close to the borders of the United States. So we had to make one more flyover by a major uh, Gary uh, Powers. Yeah, Gary, Gary Powers had to make one more flight over there. And Kenny O'Donnell was the chief of the staff of the White House, brought him into his office. And he said to a major powers, you 
know, we have to do one more low reconnaissance flight so that we can get some pictures. And if you get shot down, we're going to have to deny that you even existed. And that is what happened. He got shot down. Gary Powers was the only casualty of the Cuban Missile Crisis, believe it or not, the only. And there were thousands upon thousands of troops and ships and planes ready. And the point was, and I'm trying to abbreviate you know, this discussion, was to make sure that the Russians ended manufacturing of building those missile sites and not being able to use them. So there was the X column, the President's Executive Committee. That we called together and decided, what the hell are we going to do? We got the pictures. We know they're there. Do we attack them first or do we wait? Well, the Warhawks, the generals, everyone, they were ready to go to war. The others weren't sure. They didn't know what to do because President Kennedy was really upset with Mayor Pinks and he got misled. So we had to really take the bull by the horns. And he decided, he says, well, let's vote. How many want to strike Cuba first? Knowing that every action causes a reaction. So eight or nine or 10 raise their hands for the first strike. How many don't want to strike first and wait than the rest of them? And then he, he more or less said, well, how do you just want to have a blockade and let's see what happens? No one raised their hand and he raised his hand. He says, I win. <laughs> because the buck stops here. He knew the consequences. You know, if we take out the country of Cuba, or if we attack Russia with nuclear weapons, they're just not going to sit back and do nothing. If we do it, they do it. They're going to retaliate. Like today, God forbid a thousand times if we have a nuclear holocaust, it's the end of civilization as we know it. So I don't think it's going to happen unless that not in North Korea, you know, and whatever, you know, who we're living with here, you know, does something extraordinary. It would be terrible. Kennedy said we're going to have a blockade. He drew a line in the sand in the ocean. And here comes the U, uh, what is the, the Russian ship, the Marukla. It was on the Lebanese registry heading towards that line. We were watching, and they call it the war room at the time. Now it's called the situation room, it sounds like a screen about like this in the underground White House watching that ship get closer and closer and closer to the line. Finally, uh, Curtis Lemay, the commandant of the Air Force, commanding general of the Air Force, says to our Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, he says, Mr. Secretary, is it time he was chomping a cigar, he wanted it to happen. So McNamara, Secretary McNamara says, yes, it is time. We have to get ready because it was that close. There were so many nautical miles away, it would be hard for them to divert or turn around. And the ship gets closer to the line. And Curtis LeMay turns around and says to me, Norman, get NORAD on the line. That's North American Air Defense. Now we're in an underground facility. I'm the communications officer. I had to step away and go upstairs to the, what they call the crypto room. Those of you who are in the service, you know, the crypto room, and it's a cure voice, contact Nori. Being of sound mind and body, the first call I made was to my mother. 
I said, Ma, fill up the bathtub with water. We went out. What in hell are you crazy? Where are you? What are you doing? I said, She's putting you nuts. I said, Ma, I can't talk. Fill up the bathtub with water for drinking water. I gotta hang up. Click. I left my wife at home and she stayed with the neighbor next door whose husband was uh, Jack Kennedy's chief telephone operator. He was on duty with me. We all had to go to the mountain to work. She was not cleared for work yet. And she was home. And I said goodbye. I didn't know whether we were coming back because it was that serious. I got Norred on the line, brought the phone down to General LeMay and Secretary, Secretary of Defense dispatched 23 nuclear armed aircraft from out of Colorado. They pulled them out of a mountain in Colorado and onto an airfield and they took off. The technology of the day, they were all down with nuclear warheads. And they headed out the west coast, they were going over Alaska. Lucia wherever it was, and over into Russia through Siberia. And they had targets to drop in Moscow. This was a technology. They had a black patch that they had on their face. And when they dropped their nuclear warhead, they had to put the black patch on one eye because they would be temporarily blinded. And when they were able to fly that, they pushed it to the other side. Can you imagine? And as they started up, and they were about halfway there, and we could see through radar an acknowledgement that the Russians were coming at us through the other way, with about the same number of aircraft. <coughs> a reaction. This is a reaction. And all of a sudden, the Lebanese registry Russian ship stopped. Now in the interim, President Kennedy wanted to speak directly with the key to cruise ship. And he contacted the White House Communications Agency, where we were. It was myself and uh, Chief Foreign Officer Bill Elder. And he says to get cruise ship on the line. And we did. And he spoke. To the key cruise ship, they've talked back and forth through interpreters on both sides. And cruise ship didn't want a nuclear holocaust, and neither did John Kennedy. No one did. So cruise ship says, Well, we, we have to say face it, what are we going to do? So he tells Kennedy, This is after some diplomatic telegram going back and forth. You know, it's a face-to-face -face thing. He said, tell you what to do. You know, in plain, simple language, tell you what we'll do. If you take down your missiles in Turkey that are pointed towards us, we will take the missiles out of Cuba. Kennedy says, it has to be done right away. Khrushchev says, yeah, I I'll agree that it be done right away. But you have to promise me that immediately you'll take the missiles out of Turkey. And Kennedy agreed to that. Little did the cruise ship know that the missiles in Turkey were totally useless. They did not work. They were just being set up. There was no nuclear armament on them. It would be like a for the July fireworks history. Kennedy says, take them down right away. And they started immediately to dismantle what they had in Turkey, and there wasn't much. And the next morning, Russia, they were taking down the missiles that they had in Cuba. However, what this country didn't find out until about 10, 12 years ago, was during that time, there were four submarines who had left Moscow, 
headed towards Cuba. And they were in the waters between Cuba and the United States. I mean, between Cuba and the coast of Florida. Four submarines. Each one commanded by a very high-ranking officer. And when they left Moscow, they were given a paper envelope. Not to open that envelope until they were in the waters off the United States undetected. And they all got, got here, and the four of them opened up their envelopes. And they were told that on each one of those submarines was nuclear warhead. And if they did not hear from the mother country to disengage, they were to use their own discretion in firing those missiles right at the United States anywhere they wanted to aim. And these were high Russian naval officers. When they were discovered, off the coast of Cuba. You know, 40, 50 miles really doesn't make any difference in between the United States and Cuba. Three of them got the orders to stand down. So they served. Excuse me. The fourth one did not get the orders. And I think it was the uh, destroyer Kennedy, that was the name of the destroyer, started to drop depth charges. We had no idea there was a nuclear weapon on that sub. Started to drop depth charges. And the sub was rocking back and forth. The temperature went up to 115, 120. And Savitsky, I think, was there. I have it in the book. I don't remember that Russian name. He was trying to maintain his composure, and it took two, he and his next officer down had the key to turn that missile on. And he was, he was sick also. Nausea, vomit, you know, it was terrible, cramped waters hot. And he decided that he didn't want a nuclear holocaust on his conscience. So he surfaced, he surfaced also. And Dr. Sergei Khrushchev, as I told those who were here earlier, stated to my wife and I that his father wasn't a nut like everyone thought he was, you know, pounding with his shoe at the United Nations meeting. His father, he says, was a softy, and he liked John Kennedy. He says that my father didn't want a nuclear holocaust, and he knew that neither did President Kennedy. So they would have to end this peacefully. You know, he didn't realize that the fourth son did not, didn't get the message to, to, and they surfaced. And that was a lot of pressure. But this country, we were this close. Because if we would have reached Moscow, and the Russians would have come here, then this would have been going on for years. It would have been terrible. And today, with the type of weaponry, that they have out there. It would be 15 minutes and goodbye. And that's how that ended. Does anyone else have any more questions? It's getting to be about 10 minutes of 8, and I don't want to bore everyone. And, and, you know, that's, that's, that's what happened. The world is different today than it was before. We still have a continuity of government program should anything happen. If this our present president loses his mind, somebody out there has to know what the hell is going on to make sure that this doesn't happen. I don't think anyone is going to be pretty fast on the guys carrying the codes. You know, it takes more than one to set them off. Somebody has to have common sense and let you know, peace you know, prevail because the next one will be the big one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you, you hear about the uh, president having 
uh, push the button. Can you talk more about what that means? Yes. As you see every president, you know, wherever he's going, you always see a man in uniform carrying a briefcase. That briefcase is usually handcuffed to him. So you don't arbitrarily leave it all. You, you just don't put that down. In that briefcase are the necessary codes for the President of the United States to call into various, one location first, who then calls into other locations. And it's pretty interesting, and it's pretty classified, you know, to, to understand what goes on. But it does take more than one. And are you sure? And are you sure? And then it gives, we know who has the key to open it up. Someone else has another key once they open it up to open up the second one inside and the third one has another key to open it up and when the president says hit it, you hit it. Let's hope that never happens. Some way, God help this country, God help the world, if it ever happens. So remote. It's such a huge, huge, huge responsibility. This is what kind of what scares me the most. He got the finger, you know. And I don't want to exaggerate anything. I mean, but he's the president. And you know, how do you trust this guy in North Korea? I mean, he is a you know. But they're not pushing anything. They're not, they're not pushing any saber rattle. They're not pushing anything. Russia, that's a, Russia ain't the Russia it used to be. <clears throat> Russia is not the Russia it used to be. The United States is still the most powerful country in the world. But there's a lot of responsibility with those features. A lot of responsibility. It's a high technological technology, technological age that we live in now. I mean, sometimes I scare the hell out of myself, huh? but I'm still there, you know, going on 80 degrees. 80 degrees of, 80 degrees, 80 years of age. Yet you remember what happened back then, like you don't remember what you had for breakfast yesterday. <laughs> And you ask the doctor, you know, the shrink. You have to go every so now and then. You know. Am I dealing with a full dick? I said, maybe I need four opinions. You don't know. But, you know, you find it amazing that I'm the last one in the eastern part of the United States that can relay these type of stories and not from books, from personal experience. And such a pleasure for me to share, and I, I still have the ability to speak and to share to the best of my ability and tell it like it is. Not fancy enough. Do I elect a little bit? Of course. Of course. That's, that's, that's my nature. It's not dull and boring. Usually people don't fall asleep during my presentations. And I want to thank Trisha. Galen, the town of Truro, to ask me to come here. And you can take some of my brochures that are there. And if you have other groups or if you have a question, feel free to call me. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. That's because when I'm gone, it's in books. And the kids, I've got to read uh, I got an A and a test. Yeah. Who the hell cares? We live. That's who cares. And our friends around the world who live it. That's who cares. And they for the grace of God go by. And thank you all for coming. Uh -huh.